Welcome everyone. Uh, as today is the second session of this workshop series, we do have every Thursday for the month of June and the 1st of July. So today will be the second session and it will be discussing digital taxes and trade services. Very uh, important, but also very current topic and it's being discussed right now. So we have a guest of a, a, a very nice group of speakers today. And the convener of today and the moderator will be Hidegun, but we thought about introducing ourselves first because this is a cooperation between the project Globe Tax Gov at Leiden University, Julian Chase at City University of Hong Kong, and Hildegun and Agustin Redonda from the Council on Economic Policies. So as I mentioned to you in the project Globe Tax Gov, we investigate global tax governance. We look at the issues of uh, taxation, implementation of BEPS, but has been also important to see the tax, uh, the trade and investment. And therefore uh, we started and we gave the, this cooperation together with Julian. Julian, I will give the word to you. Thank you, Emma. So exactly, I'm the, the trade investment lawyer, at least I pretend to be. And so I gladly joined the project launched by Emma and, uh, and our colleagues at Leiden. Um, as you see, I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm very corporate tonight, and there is the logo somewhere there. Um, I'll be uh, uh, chairing next week uh, webinar, which will be the one focusing on the dispute settlements of tax disputes and the dispute settlements uh, involving non-tax international courts, such as the WTO, Investment Tribunals, and the uh, United Nations ICJ, as well as the European Court of Justice. Um, so I look forward to, to listening uh, tonight's presentation, of course, and I welcome you all to attend next week uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. And please note that the first seminar, the first workshop took place last week, Thursday, and we already have the recording and the slides available for everyone. So you can also uh, watch them and look at the slides. I will give the word to Agustin. Agustin, please. Yes, thanks, Irma. Yeah, um, I also work as Hildegun uh, with the Council on Economic Policies based in Zurich. Uh, we are hosting uh, today's uh, seminar that Hildegun will be leading. And I personally invite you all to take part in session four that will take part, um, place on Thursday, the 24th of June. Uh, and that will be focused on tax incentives for investment um, with a focus on all the new challenges for international trade. So you have a great lineup uh, that day as well. Uh, yeah, um, we very much look forward to the series. And also, I don't know whether you mentioned him already, the very last session will be a policy uh, panel where also we will have in a great uh, lineup of speakers. So thanks a lot. Yes, thank you, Agustin. And yes, the final panel, uh, we have, a, for, for instance, a Cody Hiller from the IMF. We have Michael Lennon from the UN. And we have Howard, Howard Mann, that is an expert international, Marion Jameson for the Directorate of uh, Trade and Agriculture, and Patrick Lowe, who is a professor in Geneva. So all information is always in the, in the program, in the, in the links that you have with the, with the program. So with this is my role of today finished. Thank you so much to all the speakers, and I will give the word to Hildegun, and she will take over. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and a warm welcome to uh, everybody to the second workshop in the series. And uh, my name is Hildegun Chivik Nordas, and I will be the moderator of this session. So today's topic is uh, digital services taxes. It's an exciting topic and of great current interest. How current? I will get back to uh, pretty soon. So digital services taxes are relatively new, but have already been introduced in 26 countries. They aim at avoiding double non-taxation of multilateral or multinational technology firms and to ensure taxing rights also in the markets for digital services, because it is claimed that value is created not only where services are produced, but also where they are used. The value is, the, where value is created in digital value chains is hotly debated, but it is clear that uh, many digital services can be produced anywhere and sold everywhere 
while taxation rights are based on where companies have a permanent physical presence. The OECD and the G20 are working on an inclusive framework to find a global solution to the taxation of multinational firms in the digital economy. If successful, the agreement could eliminate the need for digital services taxes. Our distinguished speakers will shed light on the rationale for and the impact of digital services taxes, as well as the state of play in the OECD G20 talks. Just a few housekeeping points before we start. So we will start with the presentations. Uh, David is in the midst of uh, the talks in the uh, in the BEPS, so he will have to leave. So we have a question and answer session after his presentation. Then we continue with uh, the three other presentations and we take a break. But after each presentation, we will also have a couple of questions for clarification. So after the break, we come back and we have a panel discussion where we will address the questions that you see in the program for today's workshop. Questions from the audience are always welcome and you can put them in the chat function and I will pick up as many of them as, uh, as possible during the discussion. So let's get started. I am delighted to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, which is David Bradbury. He is uh, the head of the Tax Policy and Statistics Division at the Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD. He was a key contributor to the, the delivery and implementation of the OECD G20 Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, known as the BIPS. He is part of the team now currently working with members of the inclusive framework on BEPS. And prior to joining the OECD in 2014, David was a lawyer, a member of the House of Representatives at the Australian Parliament and served in ministerial office, including as Australia's assistant treasurer with responsibility for tax policy. David, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Hildegan, and great to be with you all. I've got a presentation that I'll... You're muted. <laughs> my apologies. I'm, I'm trying to get my, uh, my presentation up on the screen. Hopefully that is now uh, visible to you all. But thanks yeah. very much, Hildegan. Thank you for the introduction and... Uh, thank you for the invitation to be involved in today's discussion. And from the outset, can I apologise for having to leave early, uh, both to all of the, uh, the, the audience, but also to uh, the fellow panellists. Uh, unfortunately, there are uh, other meetings that are taking place that were not anticipated that, uh, that I need to be involved in. Now, I thought I might spend uh, a few moments setting the scene and providing some of the, the broader context to these um, issues and discussions around um, digital services taxes and uh, specifically the, the unilateral measures that have received so much attention in the context of the work that has been done on the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. I thought uh, I will also uh, share with you some of the insights that we found from the economic impact assessment that we did last year uh, and to outline some of the next steps in terms of the process as we move forward. So to, to begin, I think it's, it's fair to say that both digitalization and globalization have raised a number of challenges to the existing international corporate tax system. And in particular, that's very much rooted in this notion of physical presence that has been so central to the way in which those rules have operated in the past. And yet uh, physical presence is really um, not necessary in the way that it once was for a major multinational firm to have a very significant presence within a jurisdiction. Now, as we've said before, the, the BEPS project, um, which uh, the, the, the reports were delivered in 2015, made significant progress. Uh, 
um, particularly addressing some of the, the tax planning issues. But I think it's also fair to say that um, the, the big question of the allocation of taxing rights was left unresolved as part of that work. And that has spurred on the subsequent discussions that are now hopefully coming to uh, something approaching a, a summit or a pinnacle uh, at the, uh, as, as we approach the July meeting of the G20 finance ministers. Now, the failure to address that key issue around uh, physical presence and the allocation of taxing rights has really led to a number of responses. And we see that in the form of some of these digital services taxes. Um, as the discussions had reached an impasse on this particular question, a number of countries said, well, if we can't reach a multilateral agreement, then we will begin exploring how we can take matters into our own hands. And that is what gave rise to a series of these unilateral actions being implemented. And we see that um, in, in both anti-avoidance measures, um, but also specifically in the form of digital services taxes. In addition to that, I think it's also a fair representation of the, the views of, of some in the business community that um, accompanying these measures have also been just a, a, general, um, a general increase in the complexity uh, and the uncertainty that the international tax rules undergoing this, this period of change have generated. And all of that uncertainty has really meant that um, nations across the world um, have come to the table to try and work out a solution to these challenges. And uh, it's in the midst of those negotiations that we are currently, uh, are currently working our way through. Now, in terms of the impact assessment that uh, we released back in October last year, and uh, it's worth noting that the, as the discussions continue, the proposals have, have changed. Uh, so this needs to be um, really seen as a, a snapshot of what was estimated at the time. But I think it also gives a general indication of what's at stake. And as part of that impact assessment, we found that between 50 and 80 billion US dollars per year in CIT revenues, in additional CIT revenues uh, were at stake. And if you consider it also the, the guilty reforms as they then were, or as they are at the moment, um, Collectively, that would represent somewhere in the order of 4% of global corporate income tax revenues. Now, of course, since then, we've seen uh, the Biden administration make uh, some announcements in terms of what they would hope to do to strengthen the guilty. Uh, and that would obviously have um, further implications in terms of the revenue impacts. In addition to that, as you will have all seen, the G7 on the weekend um, were um, reaching agreement uh, amongst themselves to advocate for a minimum tax of at least 15%. And so as the international negotiations um, move forward with what might be described as uh, a higher level of ambition on Pillar 2, I think it's fair to say that uh, the estimates that were produced in October last year are now underestimates of the proposals that are currently under consideration. We also found that the reforms would lead to a more favourable environment for investment and growth. And importantly, for the discussion that we're about to have today, we undertook some analysis um, and we really sought to compare the consensus scenario with a scenario where consensus could not be achieved. And the, the no consensus scenario would really be um, an evolution of the status quo. And that would involve a continued proliferation of unilateral tax measures such as the digital services taxes. And we found that under a worst case scenario, um, taking into account the trade responses and trade retaliatory implications, that um, a, a world without a solution uh, could ultimately lead to a scenario uh, where more than 1% of global GDP would be shaved off as a result of this failure to reach a consensus on the international tax rules. And we also made some observations about the extent to which uh, the COVID crisis is, is only likely to exacerbate some of those underlying tensions 
that this project has been focused on addressing. Um, now, uh, the next slide um, I won't spend a lot of time on, but uh, just to make the, the point, uh, and I may have assumed that, that this was widely understood, but there are two pillars to the reforms that are under consideration. Pillar one, which is directed towards a reallocation of taxing rights, uh, the creation of a nexus in circumstances uh, where there is a, a presence in a jurisdiction uh, defined by um, a volume of sales, a, 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 an amount of sales. Um, so um, a number of things that Pillar 1 would achieve. Um, it would, for the first time, consider the profitability of a multinational group as a whole. Uh, it would also seek to allocate a portion of taxing rights on um, residual profits of, of multinationals into market jurisdictions. Uh, and it would do so by creation of a new nexus. Now, as uh, you may be aware, having uh, followed the negotiations in most recent times, we see that Pillar 1 is now um, much more focused on a more comprehensive scope in terms of industries within scope. But um, the discussions are focusing in on a smaller group of in-scope companies. And so the idea would be that it would be targeted very much uh, towards the largest and the most profitable of multinational enterprise groups across the globe. And you may have heard people talk about around 100 groups. Um, roughly in that ballpark is, is where the discussions are currently underway. And you see from this slide on the left-hand panel, the uh, impact of what was the proposal back in October. Um, and you see uh, generally rev revenue gains across high middle and low income jurisdictions, slightly better for low income than high income uh, and middle income somewhere in the middle. And then we also see um, what was uh, estimated at pillar two back in October. And we see high income countries uh, doing well, uh, low income countries also doing quite well and, and middle income countries gaining uh, a little bit less, but all countries uh, gaining uh, quite comfortably um, or on average um, under that, uh, that scenario. Now, the baseline um, scenario that was considered in the October impact assessment was a 12.5% minimum tax rate. So if the discussions are now in the space of 15% or potentially higher than 15%, uh, that increased level of ambition, as I said earlier, is likely to lead to um, a higher level of revenue gains uh, if uh, Pillar 2 were to be agreed and implemented. Now, in terms of the investment effects, I've reflected on some of these things uh, at a high level, but uh, we uh, considered the investment effects uh, of uh, the slight increase in taxation globally that uh, this reallocation of taxing rights would affect. Uh, and we see that it has a very, very minor impact on GDP. Um, we considered uh, that the impacts of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 uh, through a range of less quantifiable means uh, will also likely have more positive implications, and that's particularly in terms of um, increasing the importance and relevance of non-tax factors, improving the global ca capital allocation, uh, and also, importantly, increasing tax certainty. Now, um, as I indicated earlier, uh, we modelled the impact of a failure to reach agreement, and that non-consensus model, that failure to reach a consensus model, uh, we estimated under a worst case scenario of uh, shaving more than 1% off GDP levels uh, at the global level. And just to underline that, uh, we have uh, here uh, a, uh, a slide um, that outlines um, what the differences between the consensus uh, and the non-consensus scenarios might be. Um, perhaps uh, just before uh, finishing up, uh, a few words on recent developments and next steps. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, you would all be aware of the discussions that uh, occurred at the G7 uh, on the weekend, and there have been a number of uh, announcements made arising from those discussions and uh, much commentary in the papers uh, and in the press recently. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, it is an important um, additional um, demonstration of support for the inclusive framework process uh, that the G7 uh, would 
uh, achieve a unified position, uh, at, at least on these broad issues that, uh, that, that they've uh, publicly communicated on. Um, that agreement will provide important momentum to the ongoing talks. And uh, it's important to note that um, the G7, an important body, but obviously, in particular for Pillar 1, if this is to be implemented effectively across the globe, it will require multilateral implementation. And the, the venue where those negotiations continue to occur is the inclusive framework on BEPS, the 139 jurisdictions that participate on an equal footing. And the inclusive framework is continuing its negotiations and discussions around uh, all of the issues associated with Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. And as we move forward with our eye on the G20 finance ministers meeting in the first week of July, the inclusive framework will seek to reach um, consensus uh, on the, the key elements and principles uh, of an agreement. And uh, that will relate to both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I think it's fair to say that the momentum provided by the G7 uh, can only assist in those ongoing negotiations and discussions. But of course, um, it's the inclusive framework where 140 jurisdictions or thereabouts uh, will ultimately need to come together and to reach a consensus-based solution to the tax challenges arising from digitalization. Now, um, I also, at the end of the slides, have provided, uh, uh, I thought I had provided a link, I can make that available, uh, to um, all of the uh, reports that the OECD released back in October, uh, the blueprint reports and the economic impact assessment. But of course, stay tuned uh, with these ongoing discussions. Uh, we look forward to uh, being able to communicate to you more broadly. One final word on digital services, taxes and unilateral measures. I think it's uh, worth acknowledging that uh, a key element of any consensus-based solution will be um, agreement over um, how to uh, achieve the withdrawal of measures, uh, digital services tax-like measures um, that um, seek to target um, the digital economy. Uh, the the um, agreement, um, the negotiations that continue will be focused uh, on a more comprehensive scope. Uh, and I think that uh, a key element of any agreement will be agreement over um, withdrawing and um, discontinuing the implementation of any future unilateral measures like digital services taxes. Of course, these are the subjects of ongoing negotiation, uh, but I think it's important for the in the context of today's discussion to make that important point. I'm happy to leave my remarks there and, uh, and more than happy to take uh, a few questions. Thank you so much for a fascinating presentation and, uh, and also the state of play, which is unfolding as we speak. That's, uh, that's interesting. We have a few questions in the, um, in the chat, so uh, I'll uh, read them to you, or do you see them? Sorry, I'm just uh, opening the chat okay. so I can see. Okay, them. but I'll, uh, I'll ask. So Stephen Shea asks, uh, if financial companies are excluded, as it appears is requested from the UK, how many companies would be in the Pillar 1 group under the G7 agreement? Uh, look, thanks very much for that question. And um, we, we are undertaking uh, uh, a considerable amount of uh, impact assessment analysis, uh, and we're sharing that principally with the, uh, with the delegates and the countries themselves. Um, but um, uh, the issue of financial services uh, companies continues to be a, a point um, that is the subject of negotiation. Uh, I think um, that the um, overall objective of having somewhere in the order of around 100 multinational groups within scope um, would continue to, to be a relevant benchmark, um, even if financial services firms were to be excluded. So I think that um, 
it's 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 an ongoing point of negotiation. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, to 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 in intervene or to prejudge uh, those ongoing discussions. Uh, but I think, um, uh, irrespective of uh, any final decisions on scope, uh, the general ballpark um, in terms of where the negotiations are, are focused is on in scope companies um, in or around 100. Uh, multinational groups. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question, which is from uh, S. Johnston. And what you, can you tell us uh, at this point about the work on identifying unilateral measures as a condition of Pillar 1 agreement? It's a good question, and uh, I, I, can't, um, I can't give you uh, much of a scoop on this one because of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the negotiations are ongoing and continue. But I think um, there's a couple of things that can be observed. And one is that, uh, as I said earlier, there will be an essential part of any agreement will be uh, a, uh, a, a process or a framework for identifying those unilateral measures um, and also a timeline uh, for their withdrawal. Uh, and of course, if you're going to require uh, the withdrawal of certain measures, uh, then it also stands to reason that you would uh, put in place restrictions on the implementation of any new measures that would be comparable moving forward. Um, but you know, this is going to be an important element of any consensus-based agreement, and those uh, negotiations uh, remain ongoing. Thank you. So uh, the next question is about um, the US consensus. So uh, do you think the US will get consensus from Senate and Congress on the G7 proposal? As it is more likely that from pillar one, the US will lose its share of revenue, which may be compensated through pillar two. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, look, it, it's I'm not going to reflect upon um, the prospects of um, of these matters um, uh, when they are brought forward at some future point uh, to the U.S. Congress. Um, but but um, I, I would uh, simply take issue with one of the assumptions in the question, and there is an assumption in the question that uh, the U.S. would lose under Pillar One. Uh, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm not in the a position, nor do I um, publicly comment on uh, the specifics of individual countries as to whether um, and to what extent they may achieve revenue gains under Pillar 1, because uh, that's something that um, we, we share our information directly with the countries, but uh, we, we have uh, not been communicating on any of that publicly. But I would simply say this, that um, sometimes people assume that that is the case for the US. Uh, but there are essentially two drivers of um, what the revenue impact for a country will be. The first one is the extent to which there are there is residual profit currently being booked in that jurisdiction that is now in scope and to be reallocated under Pillar 1. That's the first dimension. Uh, and the second dimension is whether or not um, a jurisdiction has customers or users of those in scope multinationals. And it, it is important for me to make the point that both of those uh, variables uh, will have an impact on the position of any individual country. And so the first question is, where is the residual profit located? And that's not always located in the jurisdiction of headquarters uh, of, a, of a firm. Uh, in fact, our analysis shows that a considerable amount of residual profit is uh, currently booked in what we would describe as investment hubs, uh, and we, we define them in the impact assessment. Um, beyond that, the US is a very large consumer market, and uh, the, the more consumers and users you have relative to um, the amount of residual profit booked in your jurisdiction, then the more likely you are to gain. So I would simply, um, uh, without wanting to, to make any specific reference about uh, the fiscal impact, for any particular country, I would simply caution um, people against making assumptions 
uh, that are sometimes based on, on, on not being focused on what the key drivers of an outcome uh, under Pillar 1 might be. Thank you. Sorry for having not turned on my camera, but <laughs> now it's back on. So uh, there is a question here, why are unilateral tax measures to address digitize, the digitalization and taxing of large corporate uh, companies without a physical presence inherently incoherent and undesirable considering tax policy has been predominantly national? Look, uh, thanks for the question. And um, look, I think there's a couple of really important points that I'd like to make in response to that. And the first one is that, um, you know, without getting into a debate about the merits of unilateral measures or not, um, the reality is that the introduction of unilateral measures that have either um, as a direct um, as a direct policy objective, or at least um, in de facto in, in practice, have targeted um, US digital firms. The reality is that those measures have generated increasing levels of trade disputes and tax disputes. And in an environment where um, we already see much fragmentation of the international tax rules, to see these heightened tensions arising from these unilateral measures and retaliatory responses uh, from the US, uh, and we're all familiar with the, the range of Section 301 uh, investigations that have been launched, uh, and in some cases, um, uh, decisions uh, in, in relation to further action. Uh, so the reality is that unilateral measures of this sort um, they are going to have an impact on the global economy because they're going to lead to trade tensions and disputes. And one of the key reasons why the 139 jurisdictions are sitting around the table trying to resolve these questions and reach a consensus-based solution is to avoid that scenario, a scenario where no agreement leads to trade tensions, trade disputes, and as I said earlier, Worst case scenario, a reduction in global GDP of 1%. So um, a key element, therefore, of these discussions and negotiations is um, how to stabilise the system with rules that are fit for purpose for the modern digital economy and how to do that in a way that brings some um, peace and stability back to the international tax order. And there is a widespread understanding and recognition across countries, even those countries um, that, that have implemented or are in the process of implementing digital services taxes, that a key part of securing that peace and stability will be uh, in order to withdraw some of those taxes uh, in order to uh, end up with uh, two pillars that will reform the international tax rules and modernise them in a way that will hopefully uh, be positive for global trade and investment moving forward. Thank you so much. So there are a few other questions uh, which I think are in the same area that you have already responded to. So let me finish with, uh, with one question. And that is, you have mentioned several times the word consensus. So my question is, how, how important is it to get everybody on board? And uh, what is the prospect for kind of going forward with the critical mass of the most important countries? And what if, uh, say, big, small but big tax havens do not sign up? Yeah, look, um, I guess you're, you're asking me to reflect upon uh, what might be the, the consequences of not succeeding as we move forward. And um, I, I um, don't really want to reflect upon that other than to say that uh, as our analysis has shown, if we can't reach agreement, then I think there will be negative consequences uh, for the global economy. And uh, you know, what is currently being negotiated, I think, holds uh, some, some positive prospects 
for success. Um, the recent momentum provided by the G7 um, obviously you know, adds further weight uh, to the ongoing negotiations. Um, but at the end of the day, um, 139 jurisdictions um, participate in the inclusive framework on BEPS on an equal footing. And our objective is to reach a consensus amongst those 139 jurisdictions. Now for pillar one, um, it, it is, uh, there, is, um, there is an absolute uh, need to secure a consensus in order to make a new system of reallocating taxing rights work and work effectively and efficiently and without double taxation. So um, we are working towards a consensus-based agreement. Um, in terms of pillar one, we, we need to get everyone on board. In terms of pillar two, um, pillar two could effectively be um, implemented um, even in under a scenario where not every single jurisdiction implemented um, a, a minimum tax. And I think it's important to recognise this. And, and I don't say this to, uh, to say that we're aiming for, for, for less than consensus on pillar two. We're, we're trying to get as many countries on board as possible. But I think it's important to make this point that if um, one or two or a handful of jurisdictions or a small number of jurisdictions seek to not be a part of the solution. Um, and if they happen to be jurisdictions that want to um, offer effective tax rates well below the minimum, then there are um, tools that are being designed that will allow other countries to ensure that that, that um, does not occur. And uh, without getting into the, the technical detail of the rules, you know, for example, the uh, under tax payments rule um, acting as a as a backstop, if you like, to the, the income inclusion rule uh, will allow uh, jurisdictions to take action in circumstances where others may be seeking to, uh, to avoid implementing the reforms and get the benefit of, uh, of offering effective tax rates below the minimum. So um, pillar one and pillar two are a little bit different in those respects, uh, but this is a package deal that we are seeking to negotiate. And we're doing that through the inclusive framework and with respect to, uh, and uh, out of respect for those 139 jurisdictions, um, you know, uh, we continue to work uh, as hard as we can. And uh, whilst we're, we're hopeful and optimistic, uh, at the end of the day, um, reaching consensus amongst those jurisdictions is what will be necessary. Thank you so much. And this has been an enlightening and interesting presentation and discussion. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to uh, following the uh, discussions in the BIPs and uh, hoping for a solution by the end of this year. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Hilda, and, and, and sorry, once again, my apologies for having to, to leave at this point. Okay, so let's... Um, move on to the next speaker, which is Wei Chu Kui. He is a professor at the Peter Allard School of Law at the University of um, uh, British Columbia. Professor Kui, is, uh, his current research interest is in the design of international taxation against the background of international trade and services and comparison of distributive policies in democratic and authoritarian regimes. Before joining the UBC law faculty, he practiced law for over 10 years and served as a consultant to, among others, the UN, the Budgetary Affairs Commission of China's National People's Congress, and China's Ministry of Finance and State Administration of Taxation. So, Thank you for joining and the floor is yours. Mute myself and then share again. Okay. You can hear me yeah. now? That's yes. great, okay. Uh, 
thank you, Hyodogon, and, and thank you to all the organizers for uh, uh, putting these events together. Uh, so when I was invited to join this panel, I was very attracted by the proposed topic, which is digital taxes and trade in services. In my research, I've come to think that looking at international taxation from a trade in services perspective is very important. Uh, but I know a few others who think the same way. So I welcome today's panel as an opportunity to discuss this perspective. In my allotted time, I'm going to set forth three puzzles about international tax cooperation of the kind that the OECD uh, and uh, more recently the G7 uh, are uh, promoting. You will see that these puzzles are best appreciated from the trade in services perspective. For purposes of my talk, I'm going to assume that the G20 and the OECD will announce a global agreement in 2021 or 2022. Uh, it doesn't matter whether that turns out to be true. Uh, my argument is that if it does turn out to be true, there are three puzzles that we need to think about. Uh, the three puzzles relate to the basic question. Um, what, are what are the goals that nations are now cooperating to achieve in international taxation? Three answers have been offered by the international tax community. Uh, they are reflected in the OECD's pronouncements, but they are confined not just to the OECD. I believe that this is a mainstream view, a set of mainstream views by the international tax community. The first answer is that brick and mortar physical presence is being replaced by scale without mass operations of multinational companies. And so this uh, to me was very well articulated in the OECD's March 2018 interim report on taxation in the digitalized economy. The second rationale uh, is uh, dated to November 2020, the economic impact assessment that David just talked about. Uh, the justification for global tax cooperation is to avert trade wars that could reduce global GDP by up to 1%. And uh, most recently, since April 2021, the US Treasury through its Made in America tax plan and the uh, last weekend's uh, G7 communique uh, has signaled that um, international cooperation can stop the race to the bottom of tax competition. Um, so I'd like to pose uh, three, highlight three puzzles in connection with these three answers from the trade and services perspective. Now, the first claim about changing trade patterns requiring um, uh, changes in international taxation, um, the puzzle is the following. By all appearances, the dominant debate about international taxation since 2018 has been about trade and services. The claims have been that uh, multinational companies increasingly conduct remote business operations, establish substantial economic presence in host countries without physical presence. It's interesting that the examples cited in support of such claims are almost uniformly uniformly in the services sector. And so this includes uh, uh, distribution, uh, such as online retail uh, through Amazon, advertising, uh, as in the case of Google and Facebook, transportation and lodging, as in Uber and Airbnb, business services, such as uh, AWS and Apple, and so on. Uh, in the terminology of the WTO General Agreement on Trade and Services, GATS, the issue here seems to be the ascendance of mode one services trade at the expense of mode three services trade. And so here are the uh, four modes of uh, services according to GATS. Uh, you can have mode one, which is cross-border supply uh, remote services, consumption abroad, which uh, has tourism as its main example. Commercial presence is what international tax uh, people call brick and mortar, uh, services delivered through controlled uh, foreign affiliates or a branch. And then finally, uh, presence of natural persons, such as sending uh, uh, consultants is mode for services. Um, what I want to highlight is that trade statistics based on this classification cast doubt on what international tax community uh, has come to take as self-evident truth um, the issue is, is there any evidence for substantial global mode one for mode three substitution? So here I want to show you some figures from the WTO's uh, 2019 uh, uh, World Trade uh, Report. What this, uh, these figures show that overall mode three services, which is brick and mortar, 
remained the dominant mode of trading services globally. Uh, it represented close to 60% of global services trade in 19, uh, 2017. And most importantly, this pattern has not changed since 2005. The aggregate decline in mode three services among developed countries, which is what you observe in this one, is very small. Um, it's observable, but it's very small. But during the same period, if you look at other economies, um, the pattern is different. For five leading developing economies that uh, in terms of services trade, this is China, Hong Kong, India, Singapore, and South Korea, there has been market rise in mode one services and market decline in mode three, uh, 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 right in mode three trade and decline in mode one trade. And so, um, uh, what this shows you is that the extent of mode one for mode three uh, substitution uh, varies a lot um, across countries. You can see for other countries, it's also the same that mode three services is ascendant for less developed countries and it's roughly flat for other developing countries. Um, not only is this pattern heterogeneous across countries, it's also heterogeneous across sectors. Mode three trade is dominated by a few sectors. Uh, distribution services is the largest and financial services is the uh, second largest. 77% of financial serv services and 70% of distribution services are traded through foreign affiliates. Um, it's actually mainly in these two sectors that the mode three to mode one substitution is pronounced. And that's only for some countries. As we've heard, uh, financial services is not at the center of current debate about reforming international income taxation. It's about to be carved out by, uh, from the OECD uh, pillars. Um, and then you look at the other dominant sectors, transportation, tourism, construction. These are most of uh, uh, sectors of trade that are unlikely to switch to mode one. And if you look at technical services, which is the fastest growing um, uh, area telecommunication, that sector has never been uh, mode three. It's mostly dominated by mode one. So in other words, uh, although mode one services trade is growing fast, there's little evidence that such growth comes at the expense of uh, mode three trade. So that's the first puzzle. Uh, what is the problem that we're trying to uh, solve? Let's look at this second uh, puzzle about trade wars. Um, so it's important to note several uh, uh, features. Uh, first of all, all of the trade wars that we have been warned about uh, has one common uh, belligerent is the United States. No other country is entering into trade wars against any other country. And in each of these potential trade wars, the US will be the party to start it. So uh, I think you can describe the situation as uh, the promoters of international cooperation claiming that it's in the collective interest of all nations to preempt one country from starting trade wars against others. Um, this seems to be an unprecedented uh, situation in international trade. Now, if you want to, uh, let's consider two further questions. Uh, one is whether the initiators of tra such trade wars might be acting against existing international agreements and what the implications are of such violations. Uh, it's the European Union's view that US tariffs on goods imported from EU countries in retaliation of DSTs would violate US uh, WTO obligations. This view follows from the proposition, uh, I think we will be discussing that later in the panel, that the DST, uh, DSTs are unconstrained by WTO rules, but the US retaliatory tariffs are disciplined by the WTO. We now know that the potential incompatibility between the US retaliatory tariffs and US WTO obligations is not a Trumpian, Trumpian aberration. The new USTR under the Biden administration has made similar determinations and threats. Um, what's striking here is that the international tax community has taken the position that um, when countries have difficulty agreeing at the WTO, they can simply move to a different forum and resolve these uh, problems. Um, a second question is, uh, what is the benefit of international cooperation? What would happen if uh, there's no international agreement? Um, it's uh, interesting that the international tax community has taken 
not only the U.S. entitlement, but also its willingness and ability to carry out the threat and trade wars uh, for granted. Um, however, it should be noted that the U.S. is initiating war against many countries at once. Um, U.S. tariffs are threatened against imported goods. There's that's an uh, important asymmetry in the tax instruments used um, uh, to follow the uh, very unfortunate war analogy that people seem to be uh, willing to invoke. Um, the U.S. is sending out aircraft carriers and ballistic missiles in response to what's perceived uh, as uh, drone strikes. Um, uh, so uh, finally, the EU uh, has uh, uh, offered uh, countermeasures to these retaliatory tariffs, potential countermeasures uh, that are taxes on U.S. exports of, uh, of a broad range of services and intellectual property. And uh, for its threat to be uh, credible, the U.S. has to be prepared for the next uh, stage of retaliation. So this is a, again, this is a very unfortunate discourse. Uh, but if we have to think about this discourse, um, it's not clear how international agreement should play out in this area. Finally, uh, puzzling claims about tax competition. I'll try to be short on this. Um, um, for the last three years, the U.S. government and much of the international tax community have inveighed against the proliferation of unilateral DSTs. But there's another way of describing this proliferation. Uh, it is a race to the top. Uh, small open economies are increasing their tax rates on foreign multinationals instead of lowering them. So why is unilateralism so offensive? Um, is the idea that the proper way to raise taxes, not raising to the top, but marching in lockstep. Um, uh, if countries individually decide to raise taxes on particular types of multinationals, it's bad. But if countries collectively raise taxes against all foreigners, it's good. Um, this seems to be uh, puzzling. But let me try to state the puzzle uh, less rhetorically from a trade perspective. Tax havens, or what David called investment hubs, have existed for a long time. And non-haven countries are complicit in their use for both inbound and outbound investments. For inbound investments, tolerating tax havens permit a host country to lower its tax rate in a discriminatory fashion and maintain higher tax rates on other tax bases, such as domestic capital. For outbound investments, tolerating tax havens subsidizes a country's own business expansion abroad. Either may result in buy, beggar thy neighbor policies. However, either type of policies may also enhance global welfare under many relevant conditions. So lawyers talk about the elimination of double taxation, economists talk about capital import neutrality and so on. Um, what's uh, interesting is that the international tax reform that the G7 signaled principal agreement to requires uniformly higher source country taxes. Uh, this raised the risk of uh, inefficiently high taxes on capital imports. In the meantime, the minimum tax proposals do not remove subsidies for capital exports. Instead, such subsidies are used explicitly to encourage source countries to raise taxes. The counterpart to this in international trade agreements will be international coordination to collectively raise tariffs instead of reciprocal tariff reductions. It's um, uh, important to reflect on why countries are doing this, um, given that the global welfare gain is not clear, and given that uh, countries don't engage in this kind of coordination in other areas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, any clarifying questions on this presentation? I do not see any. So then we move on to the next presentation which is uh, Wei Wei Zhang. She is a lawyer and economist uh, who, works for, who works for Sydney Austin's Geneva office, where she advises uh, clients on WTO dispute settlement, including consultations and proceedings before the WTO panels and the appellate body. She also teaches international economic law with the focus on trade and services. Uh, Wei Wei, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much, Hildegard. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. So thank you very much for the invitation. The theme of this session is digital services tax and trading services. And I'm approaching this topic from an international trade law perspective. But in order to avoid generalizing my legal observation, I think it's important that at the beginning, I will set out uh, a scene to describe what are the DSTs and the, especially the variations in these DSTs. Next, I will explore the relevance of international trade and trade law uh, to our discussion of today. Especially I approach this topic from two aspects. First, DST themselves as a measure affecting trading services. And second, the countermeasures, especially uh, what the US has uh, been investigating under section 301 of its domestic trade law. And finally, I conclude by providing some thoughts on whether the intersection between trade and tax will cease if the inclusive framework reach an agreement by the end of this year. Now, first thing first, uh, digital services tax. In the past two years, we have witnessed a proliferation of DSTs from less than four in the beginning of 2019 to more than 20 by the end of 2020. Plus that some nine jurisdictions at that time is under legislation and the four are under consideration. So you can see clearly the proliferation of the DST and that's the background of our discussion today. Now, not all these DS DSTs are the same. They differ in their design elements. In particular, there are normally three design elements. First, um, companies that uh, will be subject to a DST in a particular jurisdiction if they provide covered digital services, and if their annual worldwide revenue from the covered services reach a specified threshold. And third, a certain portion of that revenue is attributable to the users from that jurisdiction. So these are the typical uh, design elements of a DST. Now, taking the definition of covered services, for example, typically DSTs cover targeted advertising service on a digital interface, digital marketplace platforms, and transmission of the user's data. However, some DSTs also cover the sale of digital content, digital content related services, or even the sale of the company's own goods or services on digital platforms. Now, this table shows how diverse the coverage of DSTs can be. Some DSTs, such as India's, can, affect, can indeed affect a broad range of companies that use digital means to provide services as well as goods. Well, other DSTs are more narrowly focused and cover only a particular type of services. Now, with these observations in mind, uh, of course, I forgot to mention that uh, the other, it doesn't mean that the other two thresholds are not important because whether you fall under these thresholds determines that uh, even the same service, uh, even the suppliers providing the same service may be treated differently. Now, with they, these observations in mind, we now look at how DSTs affect trading services. Now, Professor Cui has just uh, um, briefly mentioned the four modes of supply of services under the General Agreement on Trading Services. That's a multilateral trade agreement under the WTO. Now, the GATT itself has a very, very broad coverage. It applies to all measures affecting trading services. The way that the GATT define trading services or oh, the, the conceptual way is based on the geographical location of the service consumer and supplier at a time when the service is uh, supplied. For example, mode one, under mode one, neither the consumer or the supplier will move 
and that relates to most of the services we are talking about today. Under Mo2, consumers move to the consumer uh, consumers move to the suppliers' jurisdiction, and under Mo3 and 4, both under both modes, suppliers move to the jurisdiction of the consumer. The only difference is that three, mode three involves judicial person, that is what we normally say commercial, presents, or FDI, and mode four involves natural person. Now, applying this conceptual structure to the DST has certain challenges. Why? As we can see here, the GATS defines only the consumer and the supplier geographically. Now, what we have, the DST, what do the DST have is that DST target highly digitalized business models. What does that mean? That means the service that the, the service suppliers provide has multiple facets in terms of it's multiple services, sometimes integrated service, and by multiple players. Now, that, this is a very simplified uh, model of a social media company. Let's say the social media company in country one uh, may engage in at least two sets of services here. So the first is advertising services, and the other is the free service it, pro it provides to its social media platform users located in country B. Now, by providing these free services, of course, they collect data. And by processing data, they are able to provide targeted services for advertisers located around the world. It could be country A, country B, country C, D, E, et cetera. Now, sometimes the company may also establish a subsidiary in country B to provide certain marketing services. Now, if country B now impose a DST on that company, what type of services it will affect? It will affect the provision at least two sets of services here, advertising and the platform related services. The later can be further disaggregated into, for example, data analyzing, processing services, business related services, entertaining services, so on and so forth. It will also affect the supply from country A to multiple jurisdictions through at least two modes of supply at the same time. Some of these transactions, transactions do not even involve country B, the country which imposed the DST. Now, why does this complexity matter or why do we need even to disaggregate the services provided by the company? This is because the way that we define the service at issue or the way we disaggregate the service at issue and how and the way we understand how the service is supplied have a direct impact on country B's legal obligation under the GATS. This is because WTO members assume two sets of obligations under the GATS. One is a universally applied obligation. It doesn't require the country to make specific commitments. And the other type of commitments, sorry, the other type of commitments is only uh, relating to the sector, services sectors where the country has made specific commitments. Now, the most relevant obligation uh, uh, here is the non-discrimination obligation, which means a country cannot discriminate against a foreign service or service supplier, that is national treatment, or discriminate amongst foreign services and foreign service suppliers. That's an MFN principle. Now, for the first MFN principle, that which is generally applied to all um, services sectors, unless the country has already scheduled the MFN exemption upon the entry to the WTO, it, it falling to the category of universally applied obligation. The second category, national treatment, only applies to the sectors and the modes of supply under which the country has undertaken a commitment. That's why I spend so much time in disaggregate 
the services at issue and to analyze the mode of supply of a service. And the, previ the previous slide we see is really a simplified model. Why it's so important? Because the way that you disaggregate the service at issue, the way you analyze the, the, uh, the, how the mode of supply plays out have a direct impact on whether the country has made the commitments under the GATT or has an obligation, national treatment obligation under the GATT. And I can say that most of the GATT disputes, the, fir the first and foremost battle and perhaps the most important battle lies in the definition of the services at issue. Now, especially with DSTs, which engage highly digitalized business model mode, mode it's especially important to have that step of analysis. Now let's have a look at how to apply uh, the, the, the non-discrimination principle to the DSTs. As we said before, the DSTs are selective. Um, a typical, a typical uh, EU style, for example, DST design elements include the definition of taxable services and a threshold or exemptions. What does that mean? That means the operation of those definitional scope may lead to a situation in which similar services supplied by different, di different business modes may be models may be taxed differently. It may also mean that same services provided by different service suppliers may be taxed differently. Now, this is a copy paste from a USTR report with an estimate of, uh, of the France DST. As you can see, um, for example, for advertising services, the operation of the revenue threshold will lead to the DST covers eight US companies vis-a-vis -vis one French company. Now, for digital interface services, 12 of the 29 covered companies are US companies. So that is uh, the operation of the definitional scope and how that could lead to different treatments. Now, different treatments are reflected not only on the tax rate, but also on the associated uh, compliance costs. The next legal question is, are these different treatment can be tantamount to discrimination in the legal sense under the general agreement on trading services? That's a complicated legal question and depends on one, whether the, the, uh, the different treatment applies to like service and service suppliers in the sense of the GATS and whether the different treatment can be tantamount to less favorable treatment again under the legal terms. Now, of course, the GATS also have exceptions. Um, the most relevant exception that a country imposing a DST can invoke is Article 14D, which relates to, to measures aimed at ensuring the equitable or effective imposition or collection of direct taxes in respect of services or service suppliers. Now, the term equitable or effective imposition, as the footnote of this, uh, of this provision shows, is still subject to many interpretations. But besides that, I'd like to bring to your attention that this exception is only available for violations to, to defend violations of Article 17, that is national treatment. However, it's not available for any violation of Article 2, the MFN treatment. Now, with that in mind, now we move to the countermeasures imposed by the US. We have read a lot uh, about the US countermeasures, especially the Section 301 um, investigation under its domestic law. The US has initiated investigation uh, re regarding DSTs in 11 jurisdictions. The seven concluded investigation found that these DSTs are discriminatory, unreasonable, or burdensome on US commerce. 
Accordingly, the USTR decided that a, the appropriate countermeasure should take form of an additional tariff of 25% on quite a broad range of products from the DST jurisdiction at issue. And you can see that the estimated affected uh, uh, trade value that would be affected ranges from 65 million to 1.3 billion. Now, there are also four other ongoing investigations, but since the DSTs in these uh, jurisdictions are not yet in force, the USTR only issued a status report highlights the USTR's preliminary concerns over the discriminatory nature of those DSTs. No decision has been undertaken under uh, these uh, four investigations. Now, of course, even though the US have decided some uh, countermeasures, it has decided to suspend the application in light of the ongoing uh, multilateral tax negotiations. Nevertheless, um, all these measures may, countermeasures may be also vulnerable under a challenge in the WTO. And if implemented, we can see uh, further escalated trade tension. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, the, 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 how the DSTs may be vulnerable under the WTO law and so as the countermeasures. Uh, people may ask, what if all these, these DSTs cease to exist following the conclusion of the, of the multilateral agreement under the inclusive framework? Will the intersection between the, between the tax and uh, trade regime stop? And I would say the intersection are always here as we, even if we have a multilateral agreement on the tax framework, they will be implementing measures by individual countries. And that themselves can also uh, bring some trade concerns as we witnesses in some uh, recent dispute, Argentina Financial Services. Now, with that note, I conclude uh, my presentation. The, the takeaway is that there should be more dialogue between the trade and uh, the tax communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. But I think those are kind of more um, they are more than just clarifying questions. So we will pick them up in the panel discussion as we move to that after the break. So with that, I uh, introduce the fourth speaker, which is Matthias Bauer. He is a senior economist uh, at the European Center for International Political Economy, is known as ESIP. And he works on international trade, the economics of digital markets and the digital economy. He works on the European single market integration, European fiscal affairs and capital market policy. Before joining ESAIP, Matthias worked at the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin. And he received his PhD degree after joining the Bundesbank graduate program on the foundation of uh, global financial markets and financial stability. So, Matthias, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Hildegun, um, for this kind introduction. And also, thank you, organizers, uh, for setting up this series of events, which will hopefully contribute to the discussions um, at the OECD and uh, additional forum like the G7 or the G20. Um, I don't, uh, I, did, I did prepare a, a presentation, um, but uh, I prepared a sort of a talk uh, which focuses on the three questions that were outlined by the organizers. And um, yeah, I will uh, start with addressing the first questions, which basically is what should be the objective of a digital services tax? And uh, during my talk addressing this question and addressing other questions, I hope to expose a few general myths and misconceptions in the debate about the rationale of digital services taxes and also 
uh, more broadly, perhaps in the second uh, half of this um, um, event about myths and misconceptions in the debate about pillar one and pillar two. So what is the objective or what should be the objective of digital services tax? And I argue that there shouldn't be any special tax on uh, digital companies, nor on certain digital or non-digital business models. In 2017, when the first proposal for a DST was announced by the European Commission, there were basically three major claims put forward. Uh, back then, the Commission argued that a European digital tax framework is needed for the digital single market to stimulate innovation and to allow all players to tap into new market dynamics under a fair and balanced uh, regime of conditions. The second claim was that digital companies are generally under text. Uh, the commission back then claimed that on average, domestic digitalized businesses only pay 8.5% uh, uh, on average on profits uh, in the EU. And the commission claimed that this would constitute less than half compared to so-called traditional business models. And the third claim raised by the European Commission was that not introducing a digital services tax would contribute to the erosion of social budgets in the EU and put at risk more generally EU competitiveness. And the commission argued that not introducing a digital services tax would undermine fair taxation and undermine the sustainability of member states' budgets. These are all very bold claims, but when you look more carefully into the justifications of these claims, you will soon realize that all of these claims are wrong and highly misleading. First of all, by taxing digital companies or any company, you take away financial resources that the company could invest to stimulate innovation internally or uh, improve the innovative capacity uh, of the company. So imposing a special tax on a company, whether it's digital or non-digital, is uh, inappropriate for stimulating innovative, uh, let alone improving the competitiveness of the EU's private business sector as a whole. Uh, second, digital companies are not under tax. The numbers that were outlined by the European Commission and that were spread like hellfire uh, on social media by leading European commissioners are utterly wrong and highly deceptive. In 2017, the Commission's internal tax department recycled some numbers from a study that uh, the European Commission uh, commissioned in the years before a study in which we see a hypothetical modeling exercise. Uh, and the commission used these numbers from a hypothetical modeling to argue that digital companies need to be charged with a special tax to achieve more fairness in taxation in the EU. PricewaterhouseCoopers and a few academics from a German university who conducted the modeling on the basis of EU member states tax laws soon distanced themselves from the deceptive interpretation of the numbers by the commission and leading commission figureheads. The authors of this study argued that its exercise does not analyze the effective corporate tax rates of actual companies, nor does it allow conclusions to be drawn regarding corporate taxes that are paid in the digital and non-digital sector. So let me give you an example um, when I looked into the claims of the commission that were made in 2017 and in the course of 2018, and when I compared effective corporate tax rates of a large set of internationally operating companies, I soon realized that many digital companies actually pay much more in tax than less or what we would call non-traditional companies. Um, take Amazon, Facebook, and Alphabet, for example, um, over the six-year time period, 2012 and 2017, and you look, need to look into a uh, rather long period and take the average, uh, because both, uh, or not, not both, many financial indicators fluctuate uh, uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, like revenues, profits, but also uh, taxes paid and deferred taxes. So you need to look into uh, 
uh, a longer uh, period, ideally, if you have data available. And when I looked into the effective corporate tax rates for this six year time horizon, uh, Amazon reported 38% effective corporate tax rate, Facebook 27 and Alphabet or uh, uh, Google for that sake, 27% uh, as well. Uh, let me repeat this, Amazon 38%, Facebook and Google 27%. And when you compare this to a few European companies, you realize that many European companies, which the European Commission would call traditional companies, um, then you realize that these companies are actually uh, reporting much higher effective corporate tax rates than European ones. Take Volkswagen, for example, 20%, Renault from France, 76%, um, Deutsche Telekom from Germany, um, 19%. Third, um, um, regarding the argument on uh, the erosion of social budgets in the EU, um, not introducing DSTs would hardly contribute nor trigger an erosion of social budgets, neither in the EU nor elsewhere. In fact, revenues from corporate taxes in the EU increased tremendously since the 1990s, the mid 1990s, and until recently, uh, showed the largest um, growth rate compared to other types of taxes, such as sales taxes and labor income taxes. Um, now, let me address the second question that was raised by the organizers. Which economic activities and what kind of firms should be subject to a digital services tax? Now, we learned before that uh, the EU proposal, as well as national DSTs in the EU and elsewhere, target a limited number of um, business models on an advertisement services, on an intermediation services, and the sales of data. And the tax is usually based on revenues or, or turnover, uh, including the taxes that were introduced in the EU. Um, the European Commission is now investigating additional options, such as a corporate tax top up for digital companies or a transaction tax uh, for digital services transactions that take place on a B2B basis. And the EU Commission wants to broaden the scope and definitions of digital uh, activities or companies subject to the DST or what is now being called digital levy. And we hear from from people engaged in the discussions and close to the commission that the commission is currently considering a new proposal that would effectively target 9,000 companies, uh, which we would consider more digital companies uh, that operate in the EU. But what we see or saw so far is what I would consider symbolism or uh, to be more frank, fierce economic populism, not only at EU level, but also at EU member state level. And I guess this is also true uh, with what we, for what we see in other uh, non-EU jurisdictions. Um, taxes on corporate income uh, account for about 9.5% of OECD countries' total tax revenues. So 9.5% of total tax revenues can be attributed to the corporate income tax, which is fairly low. I once estimated, uh, based on information that we received from national governments, that new taxes on digital services would account for very low, de facto negligible, negligible shares on government's total annual tax revenues. Uh, for Austria, for example, this number would, um, would be 0.15% of total uh, annual tax revenues, 0.05% in France, and 0.29% in Spain. And for Spain, the Technical Experts Union at the Finance Ministry actually stated that this forecast could be over overestimate. And at the same time, uh, more recently, I heard from colleagues in Spain uh, telling me that the Spanish, Spanish Finance Ministry is actually not sure if it can actually cover the cost of the DST administration and associated uh, tax collection activities. Now, looking at these numbers, uh, I would rather like to see DSTs to remain in place in, let's say, 20 or 26 countries in the world rather than an OECD mediated global agreement that causes global tax income, uh, pardon, global uh, corporate tax uh, uh, burden to rise on average, as was indicated earlier by, by David. Uh, and I think a few more trade and tax disputes hardly cause a GDP decline of 1% as was suggested by the OECD's rudimentary impact assessment for pillar one and pillar two. And now to conclude with, uh, the, with a, 
a brief reply to the third question, which uh, is uh, what would be the benefits of a global agreement and what would be the cost of unilateral action? So generally, I think there are no benefits uh, that we receive from DSTs, neither uh, from uh, unilaterally applied DSTs nor from a global agreement on a, on a, a DST. Uh, DSTs are, from my point of view, a crude reflection of economic nationalism. It is a tax on the competitiveness on uh, foreign uh, companies. Um, DSTs generally are hybrids, combining the features of corporate taxes, sales taxes, and importantly, and we, we've uh, heard that from, from the previous interventions, import tariffs on services. And due to their design, they are de facto discriminatory. DSTs um, are discriminatory uh, because, uh, for example, in the EU, they deliberately um, uh, are, they are deliberately based on revenue thresholds uh, that discriminate against non-EU companies, mainly US technology companies. On top of that, DSTs simply can't contribute to any fairness or any perceived fairness in international taxation. Uh, DSTs nationally applied or global DSTs would render an already very opaque corporate tax system even more opaque, probably increasing the number of tax disputes. Uh, and I think this is also a very important argument that we uh, rarely see in the debate about the rationale of DSTs. Uh, they uh, come with pass on effects as uh, corporate taxes uh, uh, in general. Uh, DSTs hit those who are most in need of modern digital services, and that is SMEs. Um, in 2019, we saw uh, official announcements from Amazon in France, for example, that they increase the fees that they charge from sellers selling goods and services on their platform in France by exactly 3%. Uh, so the, the, the burden imposed by the French government on Amazon is directly passed on to uh, the sellers uh, on their platform, and this is mainly SMEs. And in addition to that, there's also the political economy and lobbying activities. Uh, DSTs tend to cater the interests of corporate tax lawyers and tax advisors who tend to be in favor of complex and inconsistent rules for international corporate taxation because it directly translates into business volume for these uh, companies. Uh, and finally, I think after all, we live in the 21st century. Many politicians argue that it's time now to update corporate tax rules because they are based on um, um, a situation uh, or a, a time in history where we saw more bricks and mortar businesses. I think uh, they are to some extent right. Uh, I tend to agree, but I think reform requires not only to focus on corporate tax, but also to focus on other taxes and in terms of revenues generated, much more important types of taxes. And that's sales taxes, labor income taxes, and capital income taxes. A corporate tax is just a very inefficient, very opaque layer on top of these taxes. And I think a corporate tax therefore cannot contribute to any form of fairness or perceived fairness in overall taxation. Uh, I would leave it with that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. So that was pretty clear, I think. So we have uh, quite a few questions in the, um, in the chat and we'll pick them up uh, after the break. But now we take a 15 minutes break and we come back and then we will address these three questions that, uh, that Matthias basically talk to. So if we can summarize them very quickly, it's about the rationale for uh, digital services taxes, their design and compatibility with the, for instance, WTO rule. And lastly, do we need them? Are we better off without them? And, and what would be a better alternative? For instance, what is negotiated under the uh, BIPs? So with that, uh, I close this first session and uh, stay stay in the uh, in the Zoom, and uh, we reconvene at quarter to four. And uh, I reckon the uh, the uh, panel discussion will be about forty five minutes. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. So we'll start with uh, the panel discussion. 
And uh, as mentioned, we will address the three questions in the, uh, in the program. So the first one is the rational and uh, motivation for this uh, EST. And uh, just to summarize, uh, if I get it right, so the rationale is to bring large multinational tech companies into the tech space for income taxation and to create or to tax where value is created and to create a fair taxation system. So that's very briefly um, how it is viewed. And um, there is one question from the audience, which uh, is to Matthias. So the effective tax rates that you mentioned on uh, the big companies, is the issue that they are really uh, so low or is there an issue with reporting profits? So I'll let uh, Matthias answer that question and also for the other panelists to, uh, to dig in on the question of rational and um, and um, yeah. So Matthias? Yeah, um, you really need to look into um, and your reports or numbers provided in databases for uh, corporate finances on a company by company basis. Um, simply stating, as many politicians and officials from finance ministries do, that digital companies are per se under text is wrong and misleading. There are a few companies that we would consider more digital or companies whose revenues are primarily driven by the sales of certain digital services that show relatively low effective corporate tax rates. But at the same time, we see numbers from uh, traditional, traditional corporate space that also show relatively low uh, effective corporate tax rate, sometimes even negative corporate, uh, effective corporate tax rate uh, when they received um, um, subsidies. Uh, and uh, these subsidies are offset with the tax payments they make on an annual basis. Uh, and these numbers tend to be very volatile. So you really need to look into um, multi-year averages uh, comparing, for example, companies only on the basis of, let's say, 2019 or 2020 values uh, would also be misleading. Um, um, yeah, um, but aggregating these companies, uh, let's say digital companies and non-digital companies doesn't make sense. And even in the space of digital companies, there are huge differences in the business models that uh, many of us would consider digital business models like cloud computing, uh, the gaming industry, uh, the financial services industry, which is to a very large extent digital and data driven, uh, and uh, the companies that are in the focus of the current debate, uh, like advertising companies and online intermediation companies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wei, would you like to uh, chip in here? Or... Sure, yeah. Uh, so I think the plan is to answer the three questions that you set out, Hildegon, right? Mm. Um, so the first question is, what should be the objective of a digital services tax? Again, I'd like to emphasize the perspective of international trade uh, in today's uh, talk. I think that's a really critical perspective. Um, so uh, I, I would say, based on my previous writing on the DST, DST the DST is a novel tax instrument. Uh, it does bear on the trade and services, as Weiwei pointed out. Um, and the fact that it's novel has uh, deep implications for uh, international agreements. Uh, in itself, we just if we think about uh, the DST as a uh, tax instrument in itself, uh, I think the objective of it should be to tax location-specific rent earned by digital platforms in a way that's compliant with international law and to do so in the most efficient, targeted, and simplest way possible. Uh, so that's the simple uh, objective of the design of the DST. Um, in terms of which economic activities and what kind of firms should be subject to the digital services tax, in principle, it is all firms that can earn substantial location-specific rent that would not otherwise be taxed under existing tax instruments. 
This means eventually uh, a broader set of firms in terms of size and sectors may be subject to the tax. Now that's in theory, in terms of tax design, what will happen in the real world through legislative processes and political bargaining is a different uh, question. Um, but I think the most important thing for us to understand, um, and this is uh, in some ways address uh, some of the discussion going on in the chat box about WTO, uh, it's critical to think about why the WTO is the way it is. The WTO um, uh, started with a long history of agreements, negotiation of reciprocal reductions of tariffs on goods, uh, whereas the General Agreement on Trade and Services is widely believed to be less successful, less uh, why, uh, encompassing than GATT because countries had greater difficulty to agree about the trade and services and how to provide market access. And an important explanation for that is that countries actually did not have uh, tariff-like instruments on many types of trade and services, uh, especially for mode one uh, services. People simply assumed that that was not taxable. Uh, the theory uh, of international agreements has a very interesting suggestion, which is, uh, tariffs make it easier for countries to negotiate because you can monitor what tariffs are being imposed. They're simple. If you can tell countries to avoid using non-tariff barriers to trade, um, uh, things can be improved both for the uh, tariff imposing country and for other countries as well. Uh, the problem with services is that the you know, tariff on mode one trade has not been available before. Um, now it's actually available. And so if countries can actually commit to removing other impediments to market access uh, for mode one services, but negotiate reciprocal reductions of tariffs on mode one services, such as DST, that would actually have scope. That would be a scope uh, for um, international agreement and for potentially for expanding the scope of GATS. So I would say that the DST is amenable to global agreement through reciprocal rate reductions, uh, possibly as a part of expansion of GATS or regional trade agreements. The cost of unilateral actions without agreement would be similar to other barriers to services trade that's not disciplined by the GATS. Um, and- uh, Sorry, we, uh, I think we, uh, we start with the first question and take the round and then we take the other questions. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay. So thank you so much for, for that interesting intervention. Actually, I think uh, I would like to go, go back to you on this uh, location specific rent, the idea of, uh, of the digital services tax, which I think it's, it's a new and interesting perspective that uh, I haven't seen before. So uh, be prepared to talk a little bit more on, on that. But before that, uh, Wei Wei, what's your take on uh, the uh, rationale and uh, for the DST? Thanks. I, I think um, the origin of the DST is because the countries who impose the DSTs believe that the users in their market contributed to the value generation of those big tech companies such as social media, et cetera. Now, this is the belief. And with this belief, they feel entitled to impose a tax so as to level the playing uh, field. Nevertheless, I don't think this is a is an agreement shared by all countries in the world. And uh, some, even within Europe, some jurisdictions does not consider that uh, the the value of those big tech companies derive merely from the user's participation. And especially where does that value was generated? People think, well, because, you know, maybe AI related uh, uh, data processing services, et cetera. So they consider perhaps the value is generated elsewhere. So it's really depending on the belief of, of the taxing authority. Um, but also actually this disagreement was also reflected in the 2000, 
2018 OECD report on the challenges arising from the digitalization, which also highlighted that there's no agreement among countries on where the value was generated, and that's a problem. And that disagreement actually carried on into the debate of right now the pillar one discussion, or I should say previous pillar one discussion before the new proposal on what is in scope uh, services or activities to be taxed. So of course, right now with the new proposal, which is only focused on a bunch of companies which are most profitable or largest, then you avoid this question of the in-scope discussion and avoid the disagreement, fundamental disagreement, I would say, amongst countries on the location of the value generation. Thank you very much. I would like to bring in Matthias on this question on where value is, uh, is created. So there is, uh, as uh, Weiwei already mentioned, a dispute on, uh, on this issue and disagreement. So could you, from an economic perspective, uh, talk a little bit to, uh, to this issue about uh, consumer value creation? Um, yeah, um, it's an interesting term, uh, value creation by the users of a specific service. I think when we look into the services that are currently targeted by the digital services tax, this belief is um, um, true for, or mainly true for, um, social media and the associated advertisement services. It is less applicable for, let's say, um, cloud computing services, uh, online intermediation services by um, retail companies like Amazon, eBay, or um, uh, travel services companies like Booking.com or Airbnb. Uh, at the same time, if value creation by users or let's say citizens becomes the criteria for uh, taxation, then um, governments would have to impose special taxes on many other sectors of the economy. Um, think of companies in the consumer goods industry, uh, including companies uh, producing cars. All of these companies have uh, departments uh, uh, um, engaged in polling consumers, um, um, getting knowledge on, on consumer preference and taste and so on. The pharmaceutical industry is engaged in clinical trials uh, with patients to collect information. Uh, and I think there are many others in the number of companies uh, that will engage in these kind of activities is probably increasing. Uh, the more data will be available and that more we, uh, the more data processing capacities will be available globally. Um, but there's another argument that I think weights relatively uh, heavily in the debate and that's the argument about uh, taxation without having um, or sales without having a physical presence or a scale without Mars. Um, and I think that's also an, uh, an argument that is, I think, misleading because there are many companies, multinational corporations, but also small companies that sell their goods and services uh, in foreign countries in which they do not have a taxable physical presence. Think of French winemakers or French cheese producers who make billions annually uh, with exporting uh, these types of goods. And these the profits made from these exporting activities are exclusively being taxed in France. And you can take pretty much every other commodity and other country in that respect. Okay. Thank you. So these uh... This consumer creation may exist, but not specific to the, uh, the tech sector. So with the, that, I wonder if, uh, if uh, Wei could uh, come in here, because uh, at least if I understand uh, it correctly, this uh, location specific rent has also to do to some extent with uh, where value is created. Could you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. Um, where value is created, uh, in my reading and among the international tax specialist ta tax policy uh, uh, specialists that I talked to in the last two years, uh, regard that as a very vague term that's used in indefinitely many different ways and therefore not particularly useful. Uh, location specific rent is a term that's um, uh, not uh, necessarily mainstream in economics, but uh, economists uh, doing tax design understand what rent means. It means uh, profit in, uh, on top of uh, normal returns. Um, and location specific rent is talked about in many ways. Uh, the most important thing, again, to bring us back to trade is the uh, most important central justification for the use of tariffs, rationalization for use of tariffs is that uh, you know, countries impose optimal tariffs to capture a share of uh, profits of foreigners, um, of the profit that foreigners can earn own only by uh, exporting to your country. Um, and so uh, location specific rent is relevant for the corporate income tax, taxing location specific rent is an important justification for the corporate income tax. It's important for resource rent taxes is important for tariffs and it's important for the DST. Okay, thank you. Um, so that brings us uh, back to international trade and uh, the DST's uh, compatibility or not with uh, the WTO. So there are quite a few questions in the um, in the uh, chat about uh, the uh, WTO and uh, whether these uh, DSTs can be and will be uh, subject to dispute settlement in the WTO. So maybe Wei Wei could uh, comment on that as a start. Okay, um, first let me just wrap up a little bit on the WTO consistency. We talked a lot about, uh, you know, um, whether it's WTO consistent or not legally. I would like to make a distinction um, between two types of DSTs. The DST is usually imposed by the European countries, mainly target a few services and services sectors. For those DSTs, whether they are compliant with the, the WTO law, especially the GATS, depends on first, the DST design at issue, especially the thresholds design, which type of companies are excluded from the application of the DST. That's a first. And secondly, it also depends on whether the specific country has made specific commitments, especially relating to national treatment obligation under the relevant modes of supply under the GANS. So uh, that's, uh, and also, it also brings a question which is not really fully answered by WTO jurisprudence is whether the same service provided by different supplier with different business model can be considered or deemed like services or like service suppliers within the meaning of the GATS, because only if they are like when you impose different treatment, that's a problem. So I would say depending on three uh, elements, but with all these carve outs and with all these uh, uh, remarks, even though there are some uncertainty in applying the GATS to those DSTs, I, I would say it's safe to say that certain elements being certain DSTs are vulnerable to legal challenges under the WTO, especially the GATS. So that's one type of the DST. There's also another type of DST, especially imposed by those, for example, Indonesia, India. These DSTs not only cover trading, uh, trading services, but they also impose a tax on goods delivered by electronic means. For these type of measures, very often they apply exclusively to foreign suppliers. And that type of measure are particularly vulnerable, I would say, under the WTO, not only under the GATS, but also the GATT 1994, and even relevant for the WTO memorandum on e-commerce. So that is a very uh, general uh, wrap up of the WTO consistency of different types of DSTs. Again, that depends on the country and DST at issue. I see some, some, some questions 
uh, from from the panel when people ask, well, you know, there's WTO a paliability crisis, and uh, I don't know whether you would like me to already address these questions right away now. Sure, please. Okay, uh, so for this question, yes, the WTO um, indeed is in crisis, especially the appellate body is not working. But right now, it doesn't mean all the dispute settlement has stopped. Dispute settlement at the panel stage are still active, and you can still see countries bringing disputes under the WTO, even under the current circumstances. The reason for that is, First, of course, people think that one day the problem will be solved. And secondly, if we think about back in the 19, before 1995, there a long time, there's no appellate body. There's only one panel stage. Why do you still need to have, and by the way, at that time, parties can also block the panel report. And why does that time there are still disputes? Well, because people, countries do want to have a binding or some somehow authoritative interpretation of the legal um, commitments under the WTO so as to have some on the on the at least um, to say that has a basis to say that this is not WTO compliant so as to gain some you know uh, power in their negotiation of the dispute because everybody wants to be perceived WTO compliant, no matter which country we're talking about. Another thing is about, I would also like to share some development under the dispute settlement is uh, some 23 countries have got together to agree on an interim appeal mechanism under the DSU, under the WTO dispute settlement. That means within the 23 countries, if there's a dispute, they can, after the panel stage, they can appeal to a uh, appeal arbitration, uh, arbitral tribunal. So that setting already also covers um, some disputes between uh, certain members. Um, additionally, increasingly, as we see, since the pallet body stopped uh, functioning, what we have seen in practice is that countries are increasingly using the interim panel report stage to raise their uh, disagreement of the report. And some report even get adopted, even, uh, even if uh, the panel finds some violation, get adopted so the, the parties do not appeal. The panel report can still be adopted by the, uh, by the WTO membership and therefore is still binding. So I would not say that the, the whole dispute settlement is dead. Of course, it's in trouble but uh, there's hope. Thank you. So the second question also addressed uh, which sectors and companies uh, does any of the panelists want to come in on that? Uh, uh, maybe I just, uh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe I just, uh, I forgot when I mentioned the, the, the two types of DSTs, maybe I can, this question follows uh, that, uh, that uh, my previous remark is that there are two types of DSTs for the European ones, the companies and uh, industries that are affected, mostly big platform operators, such as online marketplace operators, Alibaba, Airbnb, et cetera, social media operators, such as Facebook, search engines, Google, et cetera. Well, for the, the other type of DST, it's quite broad. Basically, everybody using the electronic means may be affected. Online marketplace operators, suppliers, and consumers of goods and services, so on and so forth. But not only that, we don't, we also need to remember there's a type of service supplier called electronic payment service suppliers. Sometimes the compliance burden, because how do the countries collect these taxes? They put a compliance burden on the those electronic payment service suppliers. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is one sector that seemed to be kind of special in these discussions, both in uh, in the BIPs and, and elsewhere, and that's financial services. Uh, maybe um, Matthias could uh, talk a bit about uh, how financial services 
fit into this picture or not? Yeah, there seems to be an, um, uh, a broad international uh, aversion to include financial services um, to the BEPS proceedings and also treat it like a digitally provided service, uh, uh, which I do not understand, to be honest, uh, because after all, we are seeing that there are many uh, highly profitable companies among the group of financial services providers, both for banking services, but also for insurance services, uh, to some extent also asset management services. And when you measure them by the uh, norms or criteria that are used to uh, establish, um, establish um, a need to act for standard or uh, traditional digital services companies like the ones that are covered by most DSTs globally, uh, then there's a lot of overlap. Um, so I don't see any uh, objective reason for why one should exclude financial services from the group of digital services in the first place. And if you are a friend of digital services taxes, then you need to uh, include it to uh, the respective legislation. But at the same time, um, and also referring to the second question, I am not a friend of ring, fence, ring fencing any particular sector of the economy. Generally, I am not a friend of a corporate tax regime in the first place, uh, because a corporate tax is a very intransparent tax. It's a very opaque trend, uh, tax regime uh, in which you cannot really identify who is actually bearing the financial burden of the tax at the end of the day. When you have a corporate tax, the tax will always be passed on to consumers, company owners or investors and workers. And empirical evidence tells us that the largest burden is borne by workers. At the same time, there is not that much of research looking in the so-called corporate tax incidents because it's very difficult to obtain publicly available data. But I can refer to one important study from um, a German team of academics, uh, which was published in the American Economic Review, a pretty good journal in the economics uh, uh, domain. Uh, and these authors, authors argue that uh, for, for data uh, from, from Germany, corporate tax data from Germany, in Germany, we have a situation where we have a federal tax and um, um, regional corporate taxes on top of the federal tax. And the authors use these data and to determine the tax incidence that is uh, uh, put on workers. And they argue that the corporate tax um, mainly affects um, and reduces incomes of workers who are less skilled, uh, younger workers and female workers. And the simple reason is that it is these people or these groups of people, these groups of workers where you can easily pass on the burden of the tax or simply any other cost burden because these people are relatively easy replaceable in the labor market. And I think this general pattern is true for our countries as well. Um, there are a few studies that point into the same direction, but again, empirical data is scarce. And I think much more attention should be devoted by academia, probably most from the economics profession, to establish this link and tell policymakers that it's not good to have a corporate tax in the first place on top of taxes on capital income, later labor income and sales taxes. So what, what would I, would, I would recommend for uh, governments that want to treat digital services or any other type of service or uh, commodity sale um, um, in a different way compared to the rest of the economy, then you can uh, introduce a uh, special sales tax, uh, which would also pass on, be passed on to the consumer to some extent, not perhaps 100%, but to some extent, but the pass on effect would be much more transparent and you can more, much more easily identify who is going to pay the burden of the tax at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, Wei, would you uh, add uh, anything to this question about um, which sectors and uh, companies? And, uh... oh, my, I already gave my answer earlier. I think it can be potentially expanded uh, to 
uh, target uh, firms that earn location specific rent. Mm -hmm. Do you see any merit in uh, in uh, introducing VAT as uh, as uh, kind of a replacement or a substitute for a DST or not at all? Uh, I'm not sure how to understand that question. In the European context, a lot of the services uh, that are actually imported uh, into uh, European countries are already subject to the VAT. So the DSD is a completely separate tax. Mm. Okay. Okay, then let's uh, turn. Uh, what, maybe maybe one more remark from my side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's certainly true. Um, but um, the VAT and the labor income taxes that are generated by the activities of multinational corporations providing digital services should also be taken into consideration when policymakers make an effort to estimate uh, what digital companies pay in tax or generate in tax. Right now, the um, discussion is corporate tax income um, centric, uh, neglecting what these companies actually contribute uh, to economic activity and derive from these economic activities what they contribute to uh, government's uh, revenue taxes from uh, sales tax, uh, our sales revenue, revenue uh, and uh, labor income taxes. So uh, here I'm referring to data centers operated by uh, large US multinational uh, tech companies uh, in let's say countries like Germany or Eastern Europe or uh, logistics warehouses operated by Amazon. <coughs> and to have a much more honest debate, more transparent debate about what's the real economic value added for economies as a whole or a region like the European Union, all of these taxes and the revenues generated need to be taken into consideration, which is unfortunately not the case these days. I think the contrary is true. We have a very dishonest and transparent debate at the OECD level. Um, many, com many individual governments, they already conducted their their impact assessment uh, for uh, different options tabled by the OCD, but they didn't uh, publish their assessments. Uh, and uh, as, we, as we've seen earlier the, uh, today, um, the OCD itself is providing uh, economic impacts on a very, very aggregate <coughs> basis for low, high and middle income countries. I think that's a uh, it's not a good way to facilitate a transparent debate. Uh, and, and again, we live in the 21st century. I think the public uh, deserves to be much more informed about what is going on, uh, including politicians who at the end of the day have their say on implementing uh, the international rules that are carved out by negotiators. And I think for most politicians, uh, irrespective of wherever they, wherever they uh, are located in Western in growth, <clears throat> developed countries or developing countries, corporate tax is uh, is an animal that they don't understand, and for them, it's effectively out of control. Okay, thank you. So I think we now go to the last question and uh, you know finish the discussion where we started with the BIPs and uh, G twenty framework. So. The, uh, the G7 agreement uh, just before the weekend uh, had some statement about uh, agreeing to uh, eliminate the DSTs as the, uh, the um, pillar one and two are being implemented. It's not super clear what would trigger such uh, an elimination of the DSTs, but uh, I would be interesting to interested in hearing your views on, on this. Will uh, the uh, agreement in, in BEPS make the, um, the DSTs obsolete and uh, would the agreement be better or worse than uh, the DSTs? So maybe we start with uh, Weiwei. Thanks. Uh, well, if we look at the G7 communique, I think they drafted the language in a very careful manner and to indicate that it's just the beginning of the 
potential global deal. And if we see the, the reactions from those governments who support such uh, new proposal is because that, uh, for example, UK, they consider that a new agreement, especially under the new pillar one, will subject most of the companies that they intend to tax with their own DST. They're already subject to the new pillar one. So that's uh, the reason, partly the reason that uh, um, the new proposal gained some support of, the, of many European countries. However, as I mentioned before, DSTs takes many different forms and have different scope of coverage. And it remains, I would say, I don't know, but it remains to be seen whether the other countries, which have a broader um, scope of application of the DST will be on board. Now, I see a question in the panel also ask about, for example, the Indian government introduced this applicable significant economic presence provisions. And the question asked did, whether I've seen that elsewhere um, in the world. Yes, it's also part of the package of the Indonesian, I think, the DST in making. They also have such a provision. The role of that, of course, is to gain certain uh, taxing right for, uh, for certain companies. And, uh, and uh, with this type of DST, the, the question remains that if, if the new agreement comes into place, whether that have, have sufficiently resolved their uh, budget concern or their intention with the with their own DSTs. So I don't know, it remains to be seen later this year. Thank you. Wei, what's your take on, on this question? Uh, can you uh, repeat what the question is? So the question is whether the DST will be obsolete uh, if there is a BEPS agreement on pillar one and two. So it's basically about, I don't know if you saw the G7 uh, declaration just before the weekend where they said that they agreed that uh, the DSTs would be phased out with the agreement on, on the BEPS. So oh, I think uh, that's what my presentation was about, right? I was talking about international cooperation sponsored by the OECD and and uh, now uh, uh, supported by the G7, um, and my view is uh, this uh, uh, era, uh, this episode of international cooperation, uh, as scholars, as people thinking about world welfare, um, it's hard to identify the source of welfare gain, and countries seem to display very unusual behavior relative to other types of international agreements they enter into. So from a trade perspective, you essentially have uh, international cooperation to raise tariffs on imported capital and agreements by some uh, capital exporters to subsidize uh, exports in order to uh, for importing countries to raise uh, their taxes on capital. Uh, so this is very puzzling. So. Uh, uh, I'm interested in thinking about that. I think the DST is easier to make sense of uh, whether or it's obsolete or not. It depends on whether we understand countries' behavior or not. So could I, just to clarify, so in your view, the DST is pre preferable to the BIPs? Uh, just to clarify, Hildegorn, I, I think at this point, no one is calling the OECD effort, BEPS, uh, it's simply the unified approach uh, with pillar one and pillar two. Um, and and uh, is it preferable? Um, I, the DST imposed, uh, we can say that it, one can understand why countries would impose DSTs unilaterally. The way one can understand why countries uh, impose tariffs in the first place uh, you, you can also understand why countries may lower their corporate tax rates to attract foreign capital. All those things are understandable uh, from an international, uh, from a unilateral perspective. Uh, the question for international cooperation is what are the negative impacts of those unilateral actions and how can countries collaborate to 
uh, achieve better outcomes. Um, and so I'm, what I'm saying, uh, what I've been saying is that the negative impact of uh, the unilateral actions are not quite clear. Uh, so the discussion of trade wars, for example, uh, discussing a scenario that's not easy to make sense of. And uh, uh, also the, the outcome of, uh, that's the focus of current international cooperation is not clear how it improves global welfare. And if we think about a system that's based on collective raising tariffs and subsidies to uh, encourage the raising of such tariffs, I think that's a situation that we haven't encountered before. So it's going to take a while to figure out why that is good for the world. Okay, thank you. That's food for thought for sure and for future research. So uh, with that, I give the floor to um, Matthias for the last intervention on this question. Yeah, I mean, um, there are different voices popping up in my mind when I hear about the G20, uh, part of the G7 uh, so-called consensus uh, and the relationship uh, with uh, we, uh, digital services taxes. Um, a few weeks ago, the European Commission clearly indicated that uh, digital services taxes will, uh, will be uh, maintained irrespective of an OECD outcome, um, at least for the EU as a whole. I'm not sure whether individual EU countries will, um, will abandon their taxes, uh, those who already implemented them um, or not. Uh, but generally, uh, it is very difficult to get rid of a tax once it is or once it uh, was implemented. And this is pretty much true for every tax that was implemented in the past. Um, so I'm very skeptical whether these digital services taxes will go away, at least uh, without external pressure. Uh, if the, the US uh, becomes more biting in terms of enforcing its retaliatory uh, measures, then there is a good chance that these taxes will go away. Um, but let me have a few more words on the G7 um, proposal uh, separately. Um, there is uh, there was this uh, reference to the 100 largest and most profitable companies. Um, to me, it is not really clear how these how policymakers actually measure uh, size, company size. I mean, you can you can look into revenue, but revenues are very volatile, and you can also and it's also unclear how they want to measure profitability. Um, you can look into profitability, but also profitability is tends to be very volatile uh, over time. Uh, and as a consequence, companies that make it in the list of the top 100 this year will or may not be on the list in subsequent years and um, vice versa. Then it is also interesting to see that the government of France, which has a DST in place, is now pushing for a minimum uh, a corporate income tax, uh, global corporate income tax. But at the same time, the French government is applying a 10% tax on patent box income, basically income received from licensing patents, copyrights for software, and other entang and, 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 and entanglement property like, like patent varieties patents, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and the purpose of the French government, and this was mentioned in the, uh, was also mentioned before, you know, corporate tax laws vary significantly because, uh, between jurisdictions and in the past 40 years, governments effectively competed for business activity, for investment and employment uh, by lowering statutory and effective corporate tax rates. And the uh, explicit intention of the French government is to, uh, by, by offering a 10% reduced tax rate on on entang uh, uh, income from uh, entanglement pro property is to create technical innovation or stimulate techn technological innovation in France. Uh, and these special treatments and other loopholes, including subsidies, they will not go away. I think the number of these, these loopholes, uh, innovative loopholes, if you want to put it that way, will increase if there is um, consensus, because governments will continue to uh, offer special treatment uh, uh, in exchange for investment and the creation of employment in their countries. Uh, so to me, uh, again, this is 
mere symbolism, I would call it economic populism, doesn't lead anywhere, except that smaller countries are worse off at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, there are many parallels between the G7 um, proposal and what we see at the OECD uh, in, within the, the scope of the unified approach before. Uh, and what it essentially means when we have this, this global minimum tax, it's, it's basically taking away tax sovereignty from smaller countries and give it uh, to larger countries. Uh, so it would shift taxing powers away and economic uh, activity away from small open economies to, and this is what the data suggests, relatively closed economies with relatively high statutory and effective corporate tax rates. So I, 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 final, final comment on, on, on this question. I uh, published a study, I think last year uh, on OECD pillar one and two uh, and came to the conclusion that the pillar one and two proposals proposed by the OECD would pave the way for a global tax redistribution framework that would transfer financial funds away from governments that embrace free and inter free international trade investment to the world's worst performing governments with respect to economic openness, the acceptance of the rule of law, corruption, state interventionism, and the recognition of basic human rights, including countries like uh, Argentina, Brazil, China, Russia, Indonesia, uh, and, and many others. Uh, and this has been entirely neglected or deliberately ignored in the debate so far. Thank you. That was a pretty strong uh, conclusion. So, uh, so with this, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, all the panelists and uh, all the uh, participants. I don't think I dare to uh, even try to summarize the debate, but uh, I have found it uh, very uh, enlightening and uh, also very interesting to uh, to get this perspective from uh, a multidisciplinary view and i think there is a lot of uh, food for future research on this issue so with this i would like to thank everybody for for joining and for a stimulating discussion and uh, look forward to future research on the topic of est thank you so much Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. All right. Thank you. To the speaker. Bye. See you next week.